All right. Well, I only see Michelle and Meredith right now, so hopefully people are back. I can't. Uh, I can't. I'm here. Kathleen's there, sitting in the dark. It looks like. Um, all right, great. Well, I'm, I'm here, but I'm eating lunch. I'm on the East Coast. Okay, good for you. Um, great. I'm going to get uh, moving pretty quick on this part um, about to, uh, to uh, how to prep and uh, to tone or not to tone. I've got my notes here, and I'm just going to jump over there real quick. After I take one more sip of coffee. All right, so I've got the camera pretty far back, and then you can see all the different things I want to show you. And uh, as always, I'm going to try to fit too much into our class and uh, be up against time, but I may be just starting the painting today. Um, we'll see. I wanted to start <clears throat> this just for those of you who are curious. Um, most of my paintings anymore are done on wood panel. Um, canvas is great. Canvas is fine, or the little flat panels, you know, painting on canvas paper, whatever you're doing. But just for those of you who are curious about what I'm doing, you know, mostly these days is um, these panels. Um, I buy them from a company called American Easel, but there's a lot of different manufacturers. Um, this one's actually on a, so this is not an American Easel one because this is a press board. Um, and this one is American Easel. If you saw it closer, you'd be able to see the wood grains. This is just raw wood at this point uh, right now. And it's, uh, it's a birch, which I really like. Um, but there's lots of different manufacturers making different types. Um, what I want to show you is this is the one I prepped yesterday for my demo this afternoon. So I did a bright yellow. I just basically wiped in a little bit of Indian yellow, very transparent color, and just a very light just a touch of the quinacridone red mixed into that. So it's a little more orange, but not really very orange. Um, and I just kind of want a nice bright underpainting because I'm going to be doing kind of a subtractive style of painting a little bit for the demo. Um, even says demo right here on this little blue piece of paper. So I know what I'm doing. Um, but what I want to show you was is very often the wood, I mean, always the wood comes uh, raw on all sides. I like to paint the edges black. And then what I do after and that, what I use is for years, I was, or for a long time, I was just using um, a black gesso, which is a very strong, high pigment black. But the problem is it's very chalky, you know, so it can absorb other colors. So it was getting scratched really easily. It was collecting dust. It was very absorbent too. Um, so then I started using black acrylic paint, which was fine. But then I realized I had this big tub of um, this one here of gloss gel. There's a couple of different uh, reasons for gloss gel, but my daughter likes to use it for some of her um, kind of almost like decoupage kind of stuff that she does with paintings and mixing different elements. And it works kind of like a glue that you can paint over, kind of like hodgepodge in a way, modge podge, whatever it's called. I don't know. Um, but, and the, there's a couple of different types of the gel, but the gloss gel is very slippery when it's dry and very shiny. So what I found is about a 50-50 mix of the acrylic gesso to the gloss gel makes a, a more crystalline finish. It doesn't scratch. It's got a nice little bit of a shine. It just looks really clean. Um, so I've got a big tub of that. I pre-mix it whenever I get low. I just mix it into a to-go container here from your local Asian restaurant, um, whenever you get soup. Um, anyways, I just mix it in there and I like to apply it using, well, a brush is fine. Um, also, I knew I had one, these simple foam brushes really work great. They make nice clean edges. What I will do is take them and put it upside down when I'm brushing. That way, if anything drips or anything else, it goes just onto my shoes, not onto the surface as much. I still oftentimes have to wipe down. I will put the paint 
onto the top edge away from the, uh, the painting surface and I'll pull the paint down. And as I'm pulling, I lift away and it makes a really nice edge. And these, I actually even painted the back edge as well. Um, so anyways, that's what I do. I paint that, I let that dry completely. It's usually dry in about a half hour, 45 minutes. Um, a little longer is better if you're going to do what I'm gonna do next. Um, so, you know, overnight, let that dry. I then take my blue painter's tape and I simply put that over the black, over the black paint. Um, let's get a, just a finished example. Um, over the black and that way that's nice and protected while I'm painting. And then at the end of my painting, I get this nice reveal where I pull the tape off. I got this, hopefully not too much paint is leaked inside underneath the tape, it does happen. Um, and I can just touch that up with more black paint to just so that paint is really thick and sticky and will generally cover pretty well. But that's just for your curiosity. I'm, that's just something I've kind of developed over the last couple of years experimenting with that. Um, so, and this one is actually raw wood underneath the painter's tape. So sometimes I'll just even do that, just put it on there so that I retain that nice clean outside edge um, because these don't need a frame. I can simply hang them and with the nice black edge, they present pretty well. And then it's up to the person that buys the painting to decide what frames they want to add that. Um, I ship a lot of my paintings all over the place, including Europe and stuff. And um, if I'm not shipping delicate frames, it, does, it takes a lot of the weight off and the size of the packaging. Um, it seems like when I was shipping you know, with frames that the frames are the things that get damaged the most in shipping. I can easily just wrap these after they're completely dry with a little bit of uh, you know, foam or whatever. And they do travel pretty well. Again, they're indestructible. The canvases can get stabbed in transit and different things punctured. Um, the panels really are nice. Um, so there's that. I won't make you watch me put the blue tape on this. I'll put it on here after class so that it's ready to go for the demo this afternoon. All right, so that gets rid of my gloss gel, my mix, and my black gesso. So I'll put those aside. All right, next step is my raw wood. And you guys, I'm sure know this, and it's kind of repetition for a lot of you, but I'm simply gonna put a very quick coat of gesso on there. When gessoing, and um, even if I get like a canvas that has, let me move this a little closer. Even when I have um, canvases that are pre-gessoed, I will put one more coat of, um, Gesso. The reason is, is I like this working quality of the Liquitex uh, gesso. Um, it's just the right amount of absorbency. I've experimented with all sorts, and you, everybody's going to be different depending on you know your painting style. And this is you know, out of focus, Michael. Uh, go ahead. This is out of focus. Your painting, it's blurry. Still not focusing. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, it has to like know what to focus on there. Sorry. Um, so when gessoing, and I will often do two or three coats, I will generally, this stuff's a little runnier. I've got two different types. I've got a heavy body gesso and this thin one. Um, this one's quite thin, quite runny. And I will start in the middle generally and work my way out. Same with if I'm gessoing paper, like I want to just do a quick oil painting, some studies on some heavy duty paper. I'll gesso the paper. I do the same thing. If it's paper, after this side is dry, flip your paper over and you can put a quick X across the back of your paper and it will help it lay flat. Um, so that's if you're gessoing papers just to experiment and play on, uh, you'll get a lot of buckling due to the moisture in the gesso. But by simply uh, putting an X across the back, you'll get that paper to lay down flat. Um, so anyways, that's how I would gesso. And then I pull it up against the edges. But I want to show you something. I'm going to grab a 
some yellow acrylic paint. I've got a disposable plastic plate here. I have a whole stack of them in the studio because I use them for all sorts of different things. I'm going to squeeze just a little bit. I could use any color I want. So this is how I shortcut the system is I will put some gesso on my plate as well. So I got my yellow paint, my gesso. Now I'm just going to mix the two. So a little bit of acrylic paint mixes great with your gesso. And now I can gesso with a colored ground. I could have put an earthy color, which is you know probably a better choice, or I could even do gray. Uh, a nice neutral gray is a beautiful uh, surface to work on, a beautiful color and value. Helps you to see your colors faster and a little more true, I find. If, if you, uh, when you um, work on a very bright color like this yellow, or sometimes I'll even do red or whatever else, it does make it harder to see your colors early on in the painting process. A lot of times in this first coat, I will actually add a tiny bit of water to the gesso to make it even a little bit runnier. I don't usually gesso perpendicularly like this. I'll usually have it laying flat on my table. I've got a whole work uh, bench on wheels behind me that I can do projects like that. Um, and um, the water will help it level out so you don't have as many ridges if you don't want as much texture. And you're just probably just gonna have to do, you know, more than one coat because it does thin it down. It doesn't quite get as good of a, an opaque coverage. But this is a great fast way if I kind of, right? Maybe I should have done a brighter color. Let's go crazy. Let's grab my daughter's fluorescent. Oh, it doesn't look fluorescent. Does that look like fluorescent pink in there? Let's put a little dab of that in there. Oh, this paint looks really old. Uh, gross. I don't even know what it's spitting out. She may have added some well, paint. Michael, what would be a neutral gray that you would use? A little bit of black gesso mixed in with it. Or black acrylic. Just a little. Okay. Let's, let's do that instead, because that pink was crazy. So let's just say instead, I want a nice neutral gray. It's going to be a yellow gray, because I've got wet, wet yellow paint. So I'm just going to grab a little bit of black gesso. Put it on there and a bunch of white gesso. This is going to be a little weird because this yellow layer is not dry. I've got a tub of water here so I can just dip my brushes in there because I um, always forget I'm not used to working with fast drying paint. I've got my oil so I can leave my brushes out for hours. But there we go. So I just put a black, mix my white. Figured out a nice neutral. It's going to be kind of a warm neutral because it does have that yellow. So that would be a nice kind of a warm gray neutral. That might be really cool. So I'll, I'll go ahead and cover that. And then with when you're gessoing, I suggest letting it dry for sure overnight. It'll feel dry pretty fast, but we really want it to um, cure as well as dry. So um, my, uh, I can get in a little bit of trouble where I think it's dry because it feels dry to the touch, but then underneath, if, especially if I put on the gesso a little bit thicker, it you know, is not as dry as I want and the oil paints can lock in that moisture um, and you can get cracking and different, uh, you know, the paint can peel off, delaminate or whatever the term is. Um, I want to make sure I pick out the hairs as I get them. Um, it's a brand new cheap brush. And then it's, it's on there, it's messy, there's a lot of texture. So I've just very lightly, just like I was talking to Michelle about, I'm going to change my pressure because before I was scrub, 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 and now I'm just going to very lightly just kind of drag my brush across. 
just trying to alleviate some of the uh, texture. If you want the texture, that's fine. It can do some really neat things. I had a student that um, has since gone on to become a pretty good selling artist. And she had, leaves a ton of texture on her surface. She gessos with the heavy body gesso. And uh, she really lets that texture become part of the painting. It has this, it's definitely kind of her own thing. It looks really interesting. Um, but it's fun whenever I bump into her work, you know. Uh, does I, she I paint really, landscapes? She does. Or, oh, wow, with all that texture. Interesting. Yeah. So anyways, there we go. Pretty. Yeah, that's a nice warm neutral gray. Got this plate, I can just chuck it, you know, I wanna be a little bit better of the earth. So I'll try to use it a couple times. I can, while it's wet, simply wipe it down a little bit. I don't mind if the plates are a little dirty. I just don't want piles of paint. And now I'm gonna end up with a nice neutral gray plate <laughs> with the more yellow tint. It almost looks a little green. Yeah, it is definitely kind of greenish. Yeah, so maybe with that one, like some pinkish clouds or something really may play nicely. I don't know. I may very well paint over it with another color or whatever else, but at least I got a nice base coat. Like I said, I usually gesso um, a couple times. Um, I just feel a little better about it. Anyways, there's the plate. Nice and gray now. Set that aside. We are flying through these. Oh, and then I wanted to share that. This is Gold Gesso by Daniel Smith. Um, I think I've shown some paintings that I paint over gold. It's just weird and kind of fun. It's very um, reflective gesso. Uh, it's very, it's tons more expensive, um, but uh, it's fun. We have, and it was out of, it, you couldn't buy it for like the last six months. So when it came on sale, my daughter and I bought three tubes of it or three bit little jugs of it. Um, if you're doing this gesso, I would suggest one coat of white gesso first because it is expensive and that first coat really soaks into the wood or the canvas, especially if it's raw canvas. Um, if you already have a pre-primed canvas, I'm sure you're able to put this on. I'm just talking about how to save a little bit of money um, doing it that way. So Michael, if, if your panel is, is primed with a oil primed canvas, yeah. You can't come back over though with the acrylic gesso, right? You surely cannot. That is a great, great question. Very, very important. If you okay. have oil prime canvas, make sure you keep them separate or you mark them. You know, I put these little sticky notes on the backs and fronts of all my canvases. Um, most of my boards, so here's one that um, this is what I'm going to do here in just a second. I got the blue tape and everything else it says put transparent glaze. So I'm going to show you that. But on the back, I actually write, is it gesso? Is it oil prime? Just on a little blue piece of tape, because I don't think the in collectors care. I can pull that off. And there, and a lot of times I'll do multiple layers. Like I'll have gesso, gesso, gold gesso. So I know what I've done to build it up that way too. If it doesn't go, it doesn't work, something happens catastrophic, paint start, painting starts to fall apart, I can then look back and say, oh, okay, let's not do that combination of things. So that's something I've learned over a lot, you know, having enough paintings that in my experimentation don't work out. So just a simple blue piece of tape on the back. Um, we buy our blue tapes in packs of 12 because we go through a lot of it in this family. All right, let me get this off. Michael, as a fairly new student, though, I'm happy to have been with you for a year now. Um, and every time I think, oh, my gosh, how could I have forgotten that? Um, but I am I have not used a, a wood panel yet because of the cost. And, and I figure at this point, I'm still such a student that I'm just experimenting and learning with the less expensive canvases. What's the question? I guess I'm just wondering, is that what you would think would be appropriate <laughs> to use just canvases well yeah because um i don't feel like i mean i don't know if i'd be what i would consider good enough to use like a a birch panel to put 
the money out for that? Yeah, no. Okay, so that's a great question. I remember when I was starting off, or um, my parents have always been very supportive of my art. And at Christmas each year, I would get one nice drawing pad and maybe a pen or two, right? And the pens I would burn through and use all the ink because, but the nice drawing pads, I always wanted to make sure I drew something really good on them, right? I knew the paper cost like 25 cents a piece, you know, something crazy. And, uh, and um, so, yeah, that would stop, that would stifle my creativeness. So I don't care about your surface. I just want you painting. I want you learning and experimenting. And if pricing is becoming an issue, like if you're like, oh, I, you know, I'm playing it safe. I'm not doing, you know, as much because this is a deer you know, surface. I'm, you know, protecting it. Then yeah, don't paint on them. Don't, don't buy them. Go cheap, paint a lot. And then, you know, once maybe you do one of these studies once or twice and you're like, man, okay, I'm figuring this out. This is something I wouldn't mind having, you know, then you can paint it again on something a little more expensive. Um, yeah, the good thing about these, in fact, this is, um, this is oil paint, which I'm going to show you next over the top of an old painting. So this has been sanded down and it's got oil prime over the top of it. It's a little slicker. I can feel it. And also I could read the note on the back that I made. So um, the panels are reusable, especially if you're not painting heavy, heavy, impasto, thick textured paint. Um, and if you do decide to sand your paintings down, go outside and wear a mask, please. The cadmium paints are not really dangerous. They have a hard time getting into our body. But if you're sanding them, they will get into you, those, uh, that, that uh, dust. Um, so definitely outside, I actually have a respirator mask, you know, like the old gas masks that I can wear. Um, the truth is I actually paid a car mechanic to, who had a really nice belt sander. He started his career making... Um, um, cabinetry and then moved into cars so he's really good at sanding and um, painting um, he was going to spray the paint on with his gun um, but we didn't end up doing that I ended up painting on myself but he sanded him down and he has one of those shops with all the filtration and everything else so I didn't even do it um, he sanded them and then I washed them down with water twice after sanding them let that completely completely dry then put on the oil prime and now let's talk about whether or not to tone our canvas. From now on, I don't believe in any of the assignments, I will be telling you I want it toned or not toned. That is completely personal. It will help. It kind of, you know, dictates the end painting, the end results. Let's just talk about why we would do it. All right. The first reason and the reason I hear a lot is the fear of a white canvas, right? It feels, you know, it's that virgin white canvas. It's, you know, we don't want to ruin it. Um, it can be scary. So simply putting on some transparent paint or, you know, putting some paint on it can kind of get us past that initial shock. Um, that's not why I do it. Um, I do it because I like, um, well, when you go out plain air painting a white canvas you can go like snow blind right it's so bright in the sunlight um, even though you try to paint in the shade it's really hard to see um, so i will often paint either the neutral gray or whatever else an earthy color um, and um, anyways that's one reason another reason is is where you anywhere you don't paint that underpainting will kind of show through a little bit and that can kind of act to harmonize the painting when you have this kind of little bit of the same color showing through in different areas of the painting that can really help to tie everything together and pull it together um i like oftentimes uh, instead of a really vibrant bright paint uh background like i showed you with that yellow a lot of times i will just use the earth mat or a yellow ochre even though that's a more of an opaque color, any kind of earthy neutral colors, um, gray. I generally personally go towards 
uh, mid value, meaning if it was a grayscale with one being white, 10 being black, I would go towards the five or lighter. If I paint it too dark, it can kind of get in the way a little bit. Um, grab another brush. What I did, and this is another thing I like about the fast matte paints. Fast matte is aligned by Gamblin paints and it's a fast drying um, oil paint. It's um, got a Galkid mixed into it, which speeds up the drying time. It also has a little bit of a, a sandy texture to it when it's dry. It's a much slower paint, meaning each brush stroke just kind of cuts off. It doesn't have that kind of super soft drag, buttery drag like good oil paints do. So it's definitely a different working quality, but the fast matte paints have a lot of um, times that I like to use them. Um, I showed this earlier in the class before we were recording. Um, this is just kind of a little underpainting I've got going of you know a little creek some marsh and then a big big clouds um this is all done with fast matte paints i just love the feeling and the texture it's going to grab my paint it's um really nice so when you go but they're not necessary you do not need fast matte paints i'm just explaining kind of why i like them um michelle no kathleen i think you were saying that your tube of fast matte paint became like a brick and it does, it becomes really hard if you let it sit. So if you get fast mats, use them. But the other thing you can do if they become brick-like, and I actually looked up the terminology and I couldn't find it. But when you, in the tube, if you just start squeezing, like playing with this tube, just touching it like all over the place, it gets soft really fast. So I can't remember uh, what that's called when a, uh, semi-solid when you start messing with it and it gets soft for a little bit. Massage? Well, massaging it. There's <laughs> a term for that. Um, that was a joke. Oh, okay, yeah. But yeah, you're basically massaging it. And I can already feel this tube really loosening up inside. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of my paint thinner, which is here to my right. And I'm just going to mix it into my, I did the fast matte earth red, but I could have chose any color I want. And I'm just gonna scrub that on there. I don't want too much paint thinner, but I want enough that it's very mobile. Um, grab a glove. What I'm gonna do now, instead of just trying to brush it all on perfectly, if you just grab, A glove with the fingers on the right side and a paper towel. I'm just going to give it a little bit of a rub down. Like I do this kind of a circular motion with a medium pressure. I'm not pushing really hard, and I'm, but I am pushing hard enough to move it around. And I love the transparent colors to do my toning with because I love the light shining through these, right? You can see how different, I'll put an actual dab of the paint on there, right? So you can see how different it is once you're getting it back to a transparent state versus a thick paint. It's much darker, but by doing, by getting it nice and thin on there, I am allowing that, that white uh, panel to still do something interesting, and that is to let the light bounce off it. So the light's traveling through this thin, glazed, transparent wash of paint, and it's bouncing back. So I'm still getting this kind of nice, reflected light. Um, by wiping it down, I'm doing two things. I'm thinning it, moving it, or three things. I'm um, moving it around nicely. I am making a fairly even surface. I don't, I can make it perfectly even if I want to spend some time, but I know I'm going to cover it, so I don't care too much. And then the third thing is, is this paper towel is pulling that paint thinner out. And so it's not slippery and slidey. So I could actually truly start painting on this surface right now. You know, some of that paint's going to come up through because it's wet and still contaminate my next layer. 
So, and because it's a fast matte paint, this paint will dry in about an hour or two. Um, definitely overnight, it'll be dry. So, um, I love the transparent colors to, um, to tint my canvases, but you can, you can use opaque color if you would like. All my notes. Paint over with colored oil paint. Oh, okay. So here we have a beginning of a painting that went nowhere. I think this is supposed to be the sun and some clouds kind of hinted in there, but nothing ever happened to it. I think the reflection. So I'm just gonna, instead of trying to remember what I where I was at, whatever I was thinking during that time, I'm just gonna paint over. So you can just use oil paint to paint over oil paint. Uh, Laura, you were asking about that a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna simply, I have fast matte white, which is my favorite. I, again, I just love the feeling of painting over the fast matte paints. Um, but if you don't have it, you're totally fine to just use a normal tube of paint and you, can, I can paint over it with simply white. Oh man, this tube is pretty hard too. Can you paint over with oil gesso? Yes, 100%. Oops, I didn't clean my brush. So it's gonna be a brownish, a brownish tan white because, but just simply taking my oil paint over the top, and a lot of times I won't completely cover it. Like you'll see some of the painting underneath. And in fact, like with that kind of painting with very little texture, I simply could have started drawing my next painting and put it right on top. But if I want more of a pristine um, surface, sometimes I actually really like painting just a new painting on top of an old painting and letting little hints of that old painting show through. I call it the ghost of paintings past. And um, and I'm just using a very, very little bit of paint thinner, just enough to get it, the paint a little bit slicker. You kind of just scrub it on there. And again, that's got a little bit of the earth red mixed into it. And I did not use my fast matte white. I just used a plain tube of white paint. But that's a great way to recycle painting. So Michelle, if you uh, are scared of painting on your panel because you're going to mess it up and then God forbid you finally get, get brave enough and paint on a panel and do mess it up, it's not the end of the world. You're not out $15, $20, however much the panel costs you. You can simply paint over it again. Of course, because I used a normal oil paint and white paint at that, it is going to take a long time to dry. So that's the big part about this. The oil prime, uh, the oil prime, which is like the equivalent of a gesso for oil paints, is kind of slow drying and it has kind of an odd smell sometimes. So I don't really like that stuff. A lot of people do, and it's great um, for doing what it's for covering old paintings. But I'll, I'll just use oil paint. If I had a lot of, uh, if I had varnished the painting and then decided I wanted to paint over it, of course I would remove the varnish with paint thinner. Before doing this, the paint just doesn't adhere to the varnish very well. Um, if it had big lumpy areas, I would sand those down probably or knock them off with a palette knife. Um, but there's that, and I can do the same like I did with the gesso. I could add you know, some color to my white paint and make my background whatever color I want using the oil paint. Let me quickly refer to my notes and see if I've got it covered. Oh, why wouldn't we? Why would we not tone the canvas? Anybody want to guess? Using transparent paints. Nailed it. Perfect. Because <laughs> that with the transparency, you can really create that sense of shine and glow um, by letting that white of the canvas, you know, the light bouncing off that 
and coming back. So there are a lot of times where I will purposely leave white um, just because I know I'm going to put, you know, like on this reference here, here's a better, on this reference here, you know, that might be a great use of this is to leave the white of the canvas showing through and then just putting thin transparent glazes of the yellow would really be glowy there. <clears throat> that being said, there's also times when I will go back into a painting that I've got pretty well done, but I'm just not getting that glow that I want. And I will add white paint into that area, let that dry and then go back in and glaze over that. So you can do that as well. That makes sense. How long does it take fast matte white to dry in a situation like that? Uh, you're, it'll be tacky within about 45 minutes um, and it'll be dry overnight, generally. Especially, it depends on how thick you put it on. I'm just kind of getting rid of all my little bit of texture and then we'll just pull this aside. Now, I'll, I'll want to put a note on the back that it's oil. So I'll set that aside somewhere. Oh, here we are. Paint over with oil paint. All right, I already made my note ahead of time, so I can put that on the back. Know what I'm dealing with. Michael, would you call your edge, your black edge, would you call that a matte or a semi-gloss or what? It's not a matte. No, it's it's definitely semi-gloss. Now, can do they... I'm sorry if you might have talked about this before in the other class, but um, do they make like a liquid text that's not glossy if you don't want any kind of uh, semi-gloss look at the end? Yep, yep, they've got a matte varnish or matte uh, glaze as well. I think we even have that in there. Yeah, I just like it because it's just like, um, you know, the house paint, right? The gloss is easier to clean off. Um, but yeah, I think a matte would probably look a little nicer. It's just, um, it would also attract dirt and things a little more. All right, so for class today for the demo, which with the time we have left, um, this is another old painting that I've just painted over um, with some white paint. And then I just used some leftover paint a couple days ago, some brown and yellow and mixed kind of a nice warm tannish, reddish tannish color. And uh, yeah, I mean, this might not be the right exact choice that I would do if I was you know, planning out for this picture a little bit better, but um, I think it's gonna do what it needs to do today. Um, so we are finally, <laughs> two hours, 15 minutes into our class. We are finally into our lesson, <laughs> um, our color lesson for the day. And that is light and dark, light and shadow family, and warm and cool colors. All right. What I'm going to do is I want, and this is what the homework is today. So if you want to write it down, the homework today is to do, find a reference that has a nice strong light source so that the objects in it are being hit by light and have a strong shadow side. So we don't really want so much all backlit or all frontlit. We want more side lit in today's picture. Meaning again, like if there's a tree, at least part of the tree is in shadow, part of the tree is in light. And what we're going to do is talk about the shadow and light family within painting. If you are in your paintings, you're having a hard time where the lights and the darks are kind of blending together. It's lots and lots of neutral, lots of mid values. A lot of times if I go back and just think about really making the lights and the darks kind of more on the extremes, and then I take out my mids for the most part, the mid gray values, the mid um, values in the colors. So I have light and I have dark. It's kind of like what we were talking about with the no tan or with, um, you know, creating. So here's our reference. You guys see that okay on there? 
And here it is again over here. Yeah. Right. So what I've done is I've changed it into a black and white. And very quickly, we can see the darks and the lights, right? There's still quite a few mids in here and I'll deal with those. But what I want to focus on is my lights and my darks. And that's going to give our objects form, right? And shadow. And uh, we're really going to have a strong source of light. And then what I did was I changed it into two values, black and white, using an app called Notan, Notanizer. I think it's a dollar or two on your iPhone if you want. Otherwise, you can just kind of think about it. But look at how just abstract it becomes, right? You almost wouldn't know what you're looking at if you just saw this. And then I took that and made it into three values. So within there, I've got my strong dark shadows and my lights and then my shadow clouds. So this is actually the reference I'm going to use to start with. Even this, to a degree, I'll start with looking at this. So a lot of times, I do not really want to think about what I'm painting too much as far as objects like water, clouds, trees, rocks. I just want to think values and shapes to start with. And I want to simplify those as much as possible. All right. So I'm going to quickly analyze my reference. All right. And one of the first things I notice is my horizon line. It's not right in the middle, but it's pretty close. So I'm going to go ahead and lower my horizon line down. And I'll probably do just above a third. So I'm really going to lower it down quite a bit because I think it would really be right out here. I'm going to lower it down to here. So let me grab a T square. And a paintbrush. And one of my first things I almost always do in my paintings is my horizon line. It's so important and nothing worse than doing a beautiful painting only to realize later that it's crooked. All right, let's see. Does that look far enough down? So, right there. So it's not a third, it's about two fifths of the way up. So I could possibly lower it a touch more, and I think I will, just to make sure I'm playing it. You know, if you put, put your horizon line right in the middle, you can do it and make a successful painting, but you're already fighting yourself a little bit and you're fighting when you put the horizon line or anything balanced 50-50 in painting and in art, oftentimes is gonna be a little bit more boring. So I'm just gonna remove that line so I don't distract myself. Can you guys see that okay? I'm gonna move the camera up a little closer. Is that good? How's that look for everybody? Fine. Looks good. All right. What I'll do is put it there and I'll move this down so you can see my colors. Okay, there we are. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at my biggest shapes, and that's this clump of trees and the reflection, and this clump of trees along the horizon. Those are my big, kind of important shapes. I'm just going to start nice and simple. I'm going to use, again, this red paint. I could use whatever color I wanted. I like to use red a lot when I draw. Um, I think that it contaminates colors less, and it kind of works with the style of painting I like to do, but whatever color you want. And you could do this with, well, I've already got oil down there, so maybe a pencil or some charcoal. I don't know what that would do, really. I've never done it. Um, so let's start with our big important shape is this left side tree. You guys can see the reference there a little bit. It's also in the email I sent out. I'm just going to think big, simple shapes. I've lowered my horizon line. I've got to remember that. Like maybe I should fold this paper so that I'm not getting confused by it. Um, so yeah, this. Is it going to go all the way down to there? 
the base of it is here. Very, very, very big basic shapes. Back here along the horizon line, I've got some trees, a couple bigger ones, and then they, and I'm not too worried about making them just like I see in the photo. I don't really love all the shapes I'm seeing in the photos. Michael, which color is not on your palette? Is it the quinacridone? No, I've got my quinacridone. It's the cad red medium is not on there. So you're using, okay, so you're using quin quinacridone red. Right. But you don't have you don't have your CAD red up there. No. Okay. This is my time. Just nothing here is dear. You know, I could take my paper towel and wipe all this right back off. It's not a big issue. Um, so I'm just trying to kind of get my big basic interesting shapes, hopefully. Um, I'm just making kind of a roadmap. This paint is pretty, pretty thin and I'll show you what I'll do to make sure it doesn't pollute uh, future colors as much either. So I'm changing the design a little bit. I've increased the visibility of this bank a little more, um, changed where it meets up a little bit. And I'm just giving me myself the big shapes. If you come in here and start painting this tree and then that tree, you know, you start protecting things and you're not, you're no longer making sure everything's working together. Got a tangent here with the reflection of this top line of trees. The reflection is lining up exactly with where these, the base of these trees. So I'm just going to lower these trees even more. So that the base of these trees and the reflection are separate. Can you see that? Maybe if I cleaned out the little line there. All right, and I can decide, do I care to draw these clouds in right now? You know, do I want some of that shape? Looking to where do they, uh, you know, maybe I don't even love the shapes of these clouds. Maybe I wanna, I, I always try to think, you know, clouds are, I can really move clouds around and make them however I want them. Um, All right. What I will do a lot of times at this stage is using a big brush or my paper towel, I will just kind of wipe a lot of this down. So it's just not so much paint sitting there. I can still see my lines, but I don't want them to show through too much in the painting itself, right? These lines are just, just for me. A lot of painters will use an actual towel and just kind of flop, 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 um, not uh, attack the painting. Another way I'll do it is just stop. Oh, this brush is crunchy. I'll just take a soft brush and I'm just pulling off a little bit of that paint. You see the drawing, it's not really doing much, but I'm taking away the ability for that red paint to contaminate future layers. Was that a dry soft brush? Yeah, dry, soft brush. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, so if you're doing charcoal drawings underneath, you'd want to do the same thing. You don't want big chunks of charcoal sitting there. So now the paint's hardly even moving. I can brush pretty hard and my drawing is staying intact, but I'm making sure that that paint is about as thin as it's going to go. All right, so I mean, this shape here is stupid, right? It's just a big, I don't know, lump. So I know that I don't want, you know, a big lump on the left side of my painting. I know that I want exciting, beautiful tree shapes. So I can come back in 
And I can carve, you know, I could draw that as much as I want. I could say, you know what, these trees, you know, come up here and kind of this, and then there's this nice canopy and it cuts in up here and then the canopy kind of continues. Um, you know, maybe there's some sky holes that are peeking through in areas. Um, maybe it reaches over a little bit so it's not all even and comes back out here, right? So I can do all that now or I could do that in a more subtractive style. Um, same thing back here, probably can, and it looks like it's going to be hard to see. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start putting in some of my shadows and then building my shapes up. So I can draw as much as I want or as little as I want. For me, I'm going to do a lot of my shaping with the colors and as I add my paint. But if you're insecure or, you know, feel like, boy, I really should have this planned out, do it. You know, draw it as much or as little as you want. Um, I like to kind of let my trees reveal themselves and things like that using the, um, in this horizon line of, of these trees needs to come up. Okay, so referring to my black and white or my three-tone painting, I know that the darks are the shadows. Right, if we look at these trees way back here, there's just a little bit of dark in these trees, but back here it gets dark again because they're more in shadow. And then up here, of course, you got big shadow area because my light source is here. And I know I said don't do backlit, but these trees are going to be backlit, but these trees are not. They're being hit along the side. So the left sides of these are in light, the right sides are in shadow. This, because it's the sun is behind it, is in shadow with light kind of hugging it, enveloping it, coming around from behind. That makes sense? Yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, that makes sense. Michael, can you offer the No Tanizer app? I, I do have the app, but I've not ever printed out the, the photos. Is it hard to do? I mean, is it just a direct link to your photos or do you have to email it to yourself? What do you do? So, I'm sorry um, to be no stupid. Tanizer app down at the bottom there. Yeah and then I just would push that arrow and save to photos save to photos into my photos and from my photos I just send to printer save to photos got it thank you yeah and if your printer is not connected to your phone through bluetooth like it's only wired in to your computer then what you do is save to photos and then email it to yourself on your computer and then print okay yeah I think that's why it wasn't okay yeah i gotta email it to myself then thank you because i'm you know just not all that computer savvy but i, li I like to well and i'm pretending that i wasn't wrestling with that all morning trying to make sure i got these printed in time um so yeah so with our shadows we're going to make sure that they're dark enough that they are not interrupting or going to interfere with any of the light colors. Again, I want to keep them separate, my shadows and my lights. So I'm just going to go ahead and because I'm being a little bit quick here, I just grab some Payne's gray right here. That's, a, you know, I don't always have black on there, but I do now. So I'm just going to grab a little bit and use that tone. I'm grabbing some French ultramarine or ultramarine blue, maybe a little of the other blue, maybe a little red. I don't know. I'm just looking to dark. Um, and I'm just gonna do a quick design. You guys, if you want, and you wanna look into your shadows and say, you know what? I already know what color that is. I don't need to just do uh, a value structure. Um, so you can pre-mix the darks in their color. I'm just going to show you a little bit of a value structure. Show a tiny bit of paint thinner. Oh, it's very blue. I want it so blue. So I'm gonna mix a little red in there. Maybe a little yellow to neutralize it so it's not just purple. I like to keep my darks thinner, right? So that may mean a touch of paint thinner, or it may mean just less paint. Um, I find if my darks are really thick, that when they dry, they'll dry shiny. 
and having glary spots where my shadows are supposed to be is the opposite of the appearance that I want to get. So a lot of times with my shadow areas, I will do a little bit more scrubbing. So let's get our darkest dark in here. And that is where this bank meets. There's no light getting into this bank because the light is from behind these trees. So that's kind of my darkest dark. Any other dark, really dark areas that are really close to that? Um, no. So that's it. That's my darkest dark, which is kind of funny. But it's pretty close to my focal area, so that's nice for me, right? Wherever that light shining through is going to kind of be the focal area, generally. So now I get to go to a, my slightly lighter color than that, which is still really dark. But I'm going to do a little more scrubbing with that. And I'm just looking for the shapes. I am not thinking too, too much of, you know, this is a tree, this is a grass, this is a rock. I want a big dark shapes. Again, I like to think of painting like the Polaroid picture, just slowly it's going to appear in front of me. I've got to trust, trust the process. Know that it will evolve, it will reveal itself slowly as I put in the right shapes and the right values in the right places. Does that make sense? Right shapes, right values, right places. If you decided to bypass this stage and go straight towards color, it's not a problem. You're doing the same thing. It's the right shapes and the right values in the right places. But you also get to add putting the right shapes, the right values, and the right colors in the right spaces, places. All I'm doing is just giving myself some notes of what's happening over here, what's happening over here. These darks give me my structure. Do you use any medium with your paints? Only, I mean, yes, sometimes, but I don't find that they are that helpful for me. Paints are so much better than they used to be. So mediums aren't as necessary. Paints are ah. better. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you want different qualities to your paint, but what I find is the more times I, it's like being a mad scientist, right? The more ingredients, more chemicals, the more things I'm adding, the less predictable the results become. Areas become slippery that I don't want slippery. Um, with just paint, it's predictable. I, I'm getting used to how the paint works. I do notice that I'm using a couple different brands and a couple different quality. This yellow is a student quality yellow, and you should have seen it when during the break I squeezed it on there and it just ran down the thing. It was so oily and <laughs> fillers. Um, and like this white, what I bought on an extreme discount from Utrecht. And I'm guessing I know why, because this thing is a brick. I could not get this white out of the tube. Um, so I don't know. Me being a cheap, cheap painter is not, comes back to bite me a lot. Yeah, I, I've been struggling with a, a couple of colors that are, you know, they're so dry out of the tube. So, and it's hard. So it's hard to slide your brush. So what I will do, and when I'm being a good painter, like let's say I've got a great big painting that I'm going to work on, and I know that I'm going to be painting on this for four or five hours straight. The worst thing is to be fighting with my paints the whole time. So what I will do is, I, the only term I've heard is called fluffing the paints, which sounds stupid. Um, I learned that from my college professor, Thomas Kitts. Fluffing the paints. Um, but what he does is he tries to make all of the paints have the same consistency. And the way he does that is mixing a little bit of oil into the paint. Um, most of my paints are uh, gambling, so they use linseed oil. So I do have a jar of linseed oil. And adding a drop 
at a time. I'll mix it into the pile and take my palette knife and whip it and whip it and whip it and whip it until all my piles of paint are the same consistency. What it does is a couple of different things. It makes the paint go further. It slows the drying time even more if I've got a big painting that's pretty technical that I really want some time working on. And all the paints just work together nicely. So um, there are certain brands that really do try to seem to try to focus on getting all their tubes of paint the same consistency, but it's really difficult because they're all make, you know, some of them are synthetic mineral or, you know, synthetic makeup. Some of them are mineral makeup and the different things that are in there that are giving those paints their color. Some of them are more thirsty and drink more oil paint, especially over time. They'll absorb more and you get, that's why your paint gets kind of drier in the tube or one of the reasons. Um, and um, so anyways, thinking about that. Um, so yeah, what I would do if, if, if you just want to loosen up your paint a little bit is um, think about just fluffing it, <laughs> mixing a little bit of mixing a little bit of uh, whatever oil, if it's linseed oil that's in your paint or, you know, different companies are make, use different oils in their paints to make them. There's, I think, safflower, which I think is actually, I don't know. I know M. Graham uses walnut oil in their paints, which are really, is really nice. So right there, what I was doing is I want to make sure that this line that I just put the base of these trees back here is much higher than the base of these trees. That will bring these trees further forward. And then the next line of trees way back there is closer to that line. You see that? So this line is just above this line. And this line is quite a ways. Oh, sorry, my arm quite a ways above that line. So that, so I've got diminishing size. I got my big trees coming forward. They're lower on the horizon line. My mid ground trees are a little closer. The size is getting smaller. And then my trees way back here are much smaller. And again, a little higher up on my horizon line. Michael, can you move the camera? so that we can see the right edge of your painting? Sure. Oops. Wow, that's close. <laughs> yeah, I might have it kind of zoomed in. I'll see if I can zoom it out a little bit. Is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, except that's really a lot of space on the right now. It, it just needed to be moved about an inch, <laughs> but thank you. How do you like that? That's fine. Cool. Here to serve. And I mean that. So let me Michael, what was your darkest dark mix again? <laughs> Payne's gray. Oh, you, okay. You're going to let us use Payne's Gray today, this week? Yeah, yeah. This one's more about values and the separation of our light and shadow families. Okay. And that will, it'll come into play um, more soon. And you can use whatever colors you really want. I just wanted you guys to see why I use a split primary palette. And this is not fully split because I only have one red. But I'm really learning that my quinacridone red can almost become my cadmium red light or medium uh, pretty easily. So I just thought I would experiment with what if I don't have it. Now I'm working on the, again, the shadow shapes that are back here, right? They're just basic. I, I, I'm just almost kind of mimicking this, but at the same time, thinking a little bit of design of like, you know, would this be more interesting? Would these trees be a little more interesting if they popped up a little higher? But I am not, and I guess I just use the term tree, but I'm trying not to think tree. I'm just this shadow area.
Am I blocking very much? Are you guys able to see pretty well? It's good. Great. I'm actually trying to watch your hand so that I can copy your hand the, the, the way you hold your paintbrush because I definitely use it like a pencil now. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm yeah, a pencil. I don't know if I've held it like a pencil yet, have I? Uh, just to dab your uh, palette. Then you, then you go back. That, so I've been practicing with you. And as, as you go, I have my yeah, paintbrush in my hand. I'm working with you. Is, right? Yeah. It's so very fast. And like, yeah, I can come in here and really scrub, 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 and then very quickly move my hand and ah, very soft and very gentle. And I can do it within one stroke. You know, that's the neat thing. I'm just kind of making sure I mimic what's up above. No, I hate doing reflections only to realize that I got to go back and put my whole reflection in and remix all the colors and uh, figure out all those shapes better. And even though this is mostly going to get obliterated, because there's uh, the, the water is moving a little bit so that my reflections aren't going to be pristine. I'm still putting them in. And I'll obliterate them in a little bit just to make sure they're kind of all in the right spot. So I'm lightening my values one more time. And you know what I'm going to go ahead and do? Um, because I know this is really getting towards that area where the light is. I'm going to warm these shadows up. And that's just to save myself um, a lot of struggle later when I try to cover them. So these should be a little warmer, not a lot, just a little, just taking my purple and or my gray purples and taking them a little bit more towards fuchsia. Are you guys kind of seeing, like I said, with the Polaroid picture, as it kind of just slowly starts to reveal itself in there? You kind of just by using the dark shadow shapes, hopefully I'm beginning to get some interesting structural elements. I can look and I can see, you know, are my tree shapes all the same? Are they all the same height? Am I just acting like a stamp tool and putting tree, 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 or are my sky holes getting repetitive? I'm already beginning to be able to test some of that um, or see some of that a little bit. Do you have any white mixed in there? Just the very little, littlest bit. Okay, I wanna make sure I understand this. As we go back further, our colors get to be cooler, but our shadows get warmer. Only here because my light in this area, I'm just thinking ahead. My light is blasting this area out. So it, the whole area, because there is some atmosphere, that atmosphere is picking up. But if I didn't have my sun backlit or an area really blasting through, it probably wouldn't be getting warmer so much. It would be getting cooler. My shadows would truly be getting cooler and lighter as they go back. Okay. That makes sense? Yes. So yeah, look at a bunch of different references and please you guys, I urge you, look into the shadows and watch how the shadows, it's a little, sometimes can be tough in photos because photos can darken shadows and light and lights. But I want you to look and see, are my, the shadows in this picture getting lighter and cooler, grayer and bluer as they recede back into space. That is really gonna help a lot in telling us the story of where things are in space. Okay, since the sun bleached out the colors back there, then the shadows are warmer. Right, because imagine, remember the gossamer sheets that I talk about with atmosphere? And those gossamer sheets are picking up the light, the color of the light as it's coming through. So right here, I've got no gossamer sheets. It's quite dark. There's no 
none of that light coming through. Here I might have one sheet, so my value, you know, that's picking up that warmth a little bit, but it's still, I still kept them dark and cool. And then over here, I've got three sheets of gossamer. So it's a little more diffused and getting a little warmer. And over here, I have, you know, four or five things. I hope that makes sense. All right, I'm going to go ahead and look into my sky a little bit, and then we're going to kind of be off to the races. So I've got a dark water down at the base and darker sky up here. I could ignore that now and bring that in later when I'm doing the colors, which is truthfully what I would do more typically of myself. I like to leave like a pristine sky area, but just so we can kind of see what I'm doing, I'm going to go ahead and make a slightly lighter value. I'm going to mix a little more paint thinner with this. I want it slipperier. A little too dark, in my opinion. Michael, I'm not seeing you. I'm seeing Kathleen. What, what's wrong? What oh, have I done? Not pinned anymore. Thank you. Okay, there you are. Uh, yeah, I should have had it pinned. Sorry. I think maybe when I stopped the video, it stopped pinned. Nope, it should be pinned. Hmm. All right, well, hopefully you're seeing me again. Well, whatever you did, it fixed it. Thank you. All right. It's probably just the fact that he started talking again. You know, I'm suddenly not seeing any any of the participants' names when their pictures come in view. Is is anybody else seeing that symptom? No, I see them. You see the names, huh? So it must be me. Do you if you put your cursor on the rectangles with the photos of us, do you see it? Well, I'm on my phone, but if I tap it, it still doesn't show the name. And I could have sworn that used to work. Oh. I'm not going to worry. I almost going to urge you to kind of ignore what I'm just did in the sky there. I think what I, that may be a little distracting. I'm actually going to take a little paint thinner, or maybe I just take a paper towel, kind of wipe that back a little bit. I feel like that may be confusing the point a little bit. Is that is that because it was too saturated? It's partly that. It's partly just because I want to kind of keep that in the light. You know, I'm talking about light and shadow family versus the mid-tones at this point. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to add in my light burst through here just so that we have a comparison basin because a comparison basis because my lights in my trees are going to be only slightly darker than they are now. And I want you to be able to see. So imagine bringing my light. So I am now in theory kind of done with my uh, shadows a little bit. At least I got my structure. So now I'm going to move on to the lights. And it's always a back and forth. It's not like I finish one and then move to the other. But I want to, um, man, this way is so thick, so sticky. It's going to definitely need a little paint thinner. My light's kind of coming across here. There you can kind of see that, right? The, the light area. And that's just so I kind of have that comparison basis. And I'll come back in and finish that. But I'm just giving myself kind of a note. Is that a titanium white you're using? Yeah, titanium white with a touch of Indian yellow in it. Just to Do you ever up. use the other whites like zinc and titanium mixed together? Yes, I believe that's right. You have Indian yellow on your canvas? I mean, on your palette? Yeah, right here. Oh, that's not the CAD yellow? No, I wanted the transparency of the Indian yellow. Oh, got it. Partly because of the demo I just did those colors. All right, so that kind of represents my light source. I've got my shadows, my lightest light, not my lightest light, because that will actually be the sun really light, but um, 
basically there. And let me wash this brush or just pick up a new brush, save some time. And I'm going to bring in and I'm going to start building up these tree shapes now. So quite a bit of Indian yellow just in the colors that I have here. And so as you as you are painting that bright white there, you weren't painting right up to the edges. You're leaving a space on the on the board. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not really shaping everything yet. Right now I'm still figuring out my big shapes, my big values, my big colors. I'm not, you know, there's no leaf, leaf, leaf or anything like that. It's all pretty big right now. I just want to say I have to leave for a moment. My neighbor across the street has kind of an emergency, so I, I may have to watch the rest of this later, but thank you so much. That's all right. You're only leaving five minutes early and I uh, hope the best for your neighbor. Thank you. So if you guys need to uh, start disappearing, I understand. I will uh, keep painting at least until I get these trees covered. Um, and that will begin to give us the structural elements of our lights and our darks. And that's the main thing I'm looking for. And then within those, and I'm gonna, in my lights, I'm gonna go ahead and start bringing in more of the idea of the color. So I've got some light on these trees back here. That's where the light's kind of enveloping around. Pretty ugly, isn't it? It's pretty, um, I'm really trusting that things will continue to develop. But I'm hopefully giving myself a good roadmap. So these trees are really getting blasted by that warm light. So that's what I was saying. It's the background value that I have is almost the same as the, the background tone that I have in this canvas is pretty similar to the color I'm putting on these trees. So for a second, it's going to be kind of hard to see until I get some of that um, some of that sky covered up there a little bit more with some other colors. You're emphasizing the color of those trees, right? Compared, yeah. Compared to the photo? Yeah. Yeah, there, I'm definitely letting the warmth of that color really blast them. And I can come back in and neutralize that pretty easy by simply just putting a color on top and neutralizing them back down if I so, you know, if I want to. Um, getting more towards yellowy yellow over here, a little lighter. Yeah, and I'll start refining this. I can bring the detail. The detail will come. Detail will show itself. And I just have to keep going big shapes to small shapes, simple to complex. Oops, I need to get back to my darks for a second because my foreground stuff is kind of in shadow. If 
But do you see how I'm making the light side and the shadow side very clear, very clear yeah. alienation? And maybe this is an extreme example with the sun really, really, really striking those things, but. All right, I'm going to come back in and start painting into that sky so that we'll be able to see the shapes a little bit more clearly. Um, and then I'm thinking I'll probably just about call it a day. Um, but what I will do is I will finish this next week because this will relate to a lot of the colors that I'm talking about and the things I'm talking about next week. So the next week will be more about color. This week was more about the design, building up that obvious light and dark. You guys, your homework is to take it as far as I do or take it and finish it. That's fine. <laughs> I will make sure and photograph mine before I get any further than you did. <laughs> there you go. Good idea. Are, are we supposed to use the same photo reference? No, nope, you're always welcome to use whatever you'd like. Yeah, I don't very rarely, but you're more than welcome to if you want. So I got orange, so bluish. So just kind of scrubbing in, getting my shapes, kind of deciding. So I'm keeping my paint on the thinner side right now, but I, um, so I can come back in and wipe it back away or add paint to it as I want to easy enough. Are you using a soft bristle brush? No, there, it's a, I'm really scrubbing it pretty hard. I don't know. If, hold on a second. Everybody be quiet. And let's see if we can hear it. Can you hear the scrubbing noise? I can't, but I believe you. Right. Yeah, I'm scrubbing. I pick up an old brush when I'm doing this because I'm being a little mean, just kind of laying in big areas. And by scrubbing in, I can add more paint to it right away. I don't have to wait for it to dry because it's going on fairly thin. And yeah, having this real sticky white is kind of changing things a little bit, but it's all right, I can adapt. Are you going to be, are you looking to have that uh, a deep level of chroma in the finished painting or is that just a, a undercoat? 
I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of testing, seeing how much can I get away with. I kind of like like this passage through here. Um, so we'll see because I don't love all the colors that are going on in this reference. It's mm -hmm. just yellow and blue, and that doesn't make me very excited, but this feels a little more dynamic to me. Yeah. So I will, I want to get it kind of covered so I can get a read on it. And then, so um, I appreciate your being patient with me as I kind of make up my mind. And that's very often the case. That's where I'll kind of get that design established. And then, ooh, and then, um, then I can play and I can play. I get my values, my design, my big shapes, just like last week I talked about getting those established. Once those are out of the way, you can kind of go buck wild with color if you want, you know, and sometimes buck wild with color means just being creative. It doesn't mean, you know, that they're garish and overly bright and crazy. Maybe it just means that, um, you know, that they could be all just uh, that I'm changing them, that I'm not sticking to my reference completely. I, I, I rarely, rarely stay with the reference for too long. It's kind of a, thanks for your help. You're no longer needed. <laughs> well, I can see what my problem is. I need to learn how to play. Learn how to play. Come on, you're a school teacher. Wasn't that your whole job was to make get kids to play and trick them into learning. Yeah, that's true. But that was so much easier, it seems, than this. So uh, you're your worst student. I am. <laughs> yeah, we're playing. We're having fun. None of this, I mean, I could seriously dip my towel into paper and in paint dinner and wipe this whole thing off right now, or I could scrape it with my palette knife. None of this matters. Right? We're just playing we're experimenting we're trying some new things seeing what colors i'm surprised that these purples play so well you know i would have i would have thought that i wouldn't be able to get away with that but once i put in that little bit of whatever color bright fuchsia up here i was like ooh, you know part of me is like yay we're you know this is a fun game that we're playing <laughs> um and you know, it was a little bit boring before because I was, you know, it's you you need some rules when you play a game. A game with no rules, you know, if you guys were ever Calvin and Hobbes fans, Calvin oh. Ball was just a game that he and his stuffed tiger play with no rules and it was always changing. Uh, you want some rules, right? You want to set some guidelines, some parameters. The saying is tennis is more fun on a court, right? Yeah. So you're kind of like, okay, here's my rules. Here's my sp space. Here's my racket or rackets. Here's my colors. Here's my jumping off point. Those are my rules. Those are my, you know, parameters. Those are my guidelines. But I can change any of those if the game seems more fun with different tools or different rules, right? Um, but I do find creativity and limitation. So oftentimes just having three tubes of paint will make me more creative than if I can reach into this well of, uh, you know, hundreds of colors that I've got in this paint, in this toolbox that I'm painting above. I don't know, that seemed like a weird tangent. But you guys get the point I'm making? I think so. <laughs> I just don't want to be Lucy on Charlie Brown. <laughs> What's that? She's always changing the rules? Well, she's, you know, she she has them come kick the football and she lifts it up. And, oh, right. You know, they go landing on their backs. <laughs> yep, just going to have to get wilder. And where I'm leaving this, where I'm putting the sky down, I am leaving quite a bit of paint there. So I can take another brush and move this paint around. There's enough paint that I can come back in and sculpt out these trees if I'm ready to. 
Um, otherwise, I've just got nice texture too. I'm gonna add a little bit of cool blue or gray up where the clouds are not covering to greenish and go slightly bluer. I don't know. That's ugly. I don't like it. So just take our paper towel, put my finger inside of it. Just so for homework, should we get at least as far as covering the whole canvas? Is that the goal? Yeah, cover the canvas. Get your lights and darks established uh, at least. And theoretically, guys, if you wanted to do it in black and white grayscale, that is okay too. Or like um, Deb did with the kind of earth colors, that's fine too. If you uh, feel like, you know what, I would like to kind of jump right to trying to do it with colors, go for it. Um, what the, I, I'm more after the theory than the end result. And that is light and shadow families, never the two shall meet. Mm. Right? Well, I just really want to... Write this down for me, please. Okay, right. So this part's going to sound a little confusing, and I'm going to try to say it right. I'm literally trying to go through it in my head. Okay. Or here's the guideline. Here's our rule for today's homework. <laughs> the lightest light in your shadows is darker than your darkest light in your lights. I'll repeat that, please. Sorry, one time only. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, do we have to pay extra? <laughs> yeah, so the lightest light in your shadows, lightest light in your shadows is darker than your darkest light in your lights. Can somebody read that back to me and see if I'm actually saying what I mean to say? Well, <laughs> I got lightest light in shadow is darker than darkest light in lights. Yes. Which makes sense to me. Will it make sense to me tomorrow? <laughs> and then I liked what you said just before that. What did you say? Light and shadow, never the twain shall meet, something like that. Yeah, light and shadow family, never the two shall meet. They are. Romeo and Juliet, all right? We're keeping them apart. And this will really help for a lot of you guys. This is really going to help. Of course, these rules are not 100%, but if you can begin to think in this, this is another tool. When, when I'm not here with you and no longer uh, giving you critique and feedback, right? The main thing I can do as a painter is give you the tools to do what I do for you without me, right? That's a good teacher. So my plan or my goal is to give you these, the ability to look at your painting and go, why isn't it working? And in this case, it's too muddy. My values are too squishy, right? There's no real strong lights. There's no really strong mm. darks. It's just a lot of mid values. It's squishy. It doesn't feel solid and it it's not, you know yeah, what I mean? It's amb ambiguous. Ambiguous, yeah. yeah. So by using these rules, which aren't rules, but they're only rules for this homework, you can go back and look and say, you know what? If I strengthened my shadows and made my shadows family a family, and I strengthened my lights and made my light families a family and had very few mids, neutrals, Will my painting come back together? Will I have structure again? So, yeah, I, I totally get that. So what's confusing to me is when you're doing a cloudy sky, is where, you know, where are the lights and shadows as compared to the sky of the background? It's just so hard to know. Yeah, and it doesn't always work, like I'm saying. That's why you need to choose your reference. Yeah. Wife. And I, I like that three that three level notan that you did that 
um, it kind of s- simplifies this the cloud so much. That's very instructive. Right, and generally, you know, in photos, your your darkest darks and your shadows will be quite dark. So I urge you to always think about at least making the darks in your shadows one step lighter. If you make your darks in your shadows, unless you're doing it very specifically and very artistically, the dark, if you make your sh- darks in your sh- clouds too heavy, they fall. They want to fall. They yeah. feel heavy. They feel like some, you know, you got to wear a hard hat out there to look at this landscape. Um, you got heavy, dark clouds falling down. And the photo will do that. Remember that the photo will darken the darks and lighten the lights a lot of times. So it's up to us to fill that information in. Um, also, even if it's in the photo and you think it's right, just say, does it help the painting? Does having these dark, dark, dark shadow clouds, unless I really want, like it's telling the story of here comes this ominous storm and la da dee la you know, if it's telling the story, yeah, use it. But if it's not helping the story, right? So those yeah, clouds, if yeah. we look at the reference, if we look at the, the reference and look at even at my notan, right? It's told me that these clouds up here are just as dark as these, right? And then I look at this and I squint my eyes. Boy, do these get dark up top, right? Right. But I don't want that. I want my sky to be open and clear. I want this to be a beautiful, huh. beautiful picture, not about, oh, this big storms coming and eating everything uh you know so so you're basically saying it's okay to paint clouds not quite as dark as they appear to be in your reference yes absolutely Uh and when you go out plain air painting i know that this happens for me as i will make them too dark too because you no longer have the uh when you look up to the sky you're no longer looking at the shadows on the ground which are always much darker than the shadows in the sky oh right you're only comparing it to what's around it so they appear much brighter because the brights are much brighter in the sky so you make the darks much darker in the sky but you have to quickly let your eye skim back and forth and see the shadows in the ground, on the ground, to compare them right, correct. So yeah, generally your darkest darks are almost always on your ground plane, in your ground areas, and your upright trees or things on the ground. And truly the darkest shadow of most things is where that object meets the ground. Look at your coffee mug with a single light source on it. Look at an apple on the table with a single light source on it. And that the darkest spot is almost always where the apple and table meet. Okay. Okay, I apologize for leaving you guys with a bit of a mess on my camera. No, it's good. It's very instructive because, you know, the, the getting the foundation is, is sometimes more challenging than getting so, to the end. Well, and without a good foundation, you're trying, you, yeah, you're chasing. It's so much better. Remember last week? I mean, I'm not saying last week's painting was good by any means that I did. Um, Oops, not share screen. Um, So you're going to lighten the clouds in this painting that you've just done. I mean, they're already much lighter than the reference. Yeah but they're not lighter than the reflection in the water. Yeah, I, I haven't done much with the water yet. Yeah, there's uh, this painting is one tenth done. <laughs> okay. One, you know, well, let's say one fourth done. And you're uh-huh. gonna finish well, it next week. Yeah, but I, I do like looking at it on the screen. I'm not unhappy. Like I'm kind of like, you know what? A couple little tweaks, make some interesting shapes and uh, <laughs> then I can, I'll probably just remix all my colors next week. You remember? Okay. So last week, before I let you guys go, just a quick rehash. Last week, I did my design and my values. Then I pre-mixed my colors. And remember, I did the painting in approximately 15 minutes. Do you guys remember? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So this week, what did I do? None of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes later, I've got kind of a mess, right? But it's still a good mess. It's a mess that's leaning towards the right thing. And so next week, and I can cover all this, 
Next week, what I will do is come back in. It'll be dry enough that I'll be able to come back in, refine some of the shapes, you know, probably put a little more shadow structure into, you know, I'll look at it and just decide what's working, what's not. Then I will pre-mix my colors. We'll talk about light and shadow family. And um, we'll talk about uh, the term just jumped out of my head. Um, what's it called? Uh, anyways, color contrasts. That's the stupid way of saying it. Um, and how, how we see color next to each other, just mm -hmm. like I talked about with the yellow needing a little purple to make the flowers pop. Oh, complimentary. Complimentary. Yes, thank you. And how do we make things appear brighter without, you know, making the colors brighter? A lot of times it's by making the areas around it duller or darker. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And so this will be a great reference for that. And um, I won't have all the pressure of finishing this in this week. And um, so I will just leave it as is. I may, no, I think I'll just leave it as is. I'm going to walk okay. away. And next <laughs> week, we'll see, if we, we'll see if we can fix it. And uh We'll walk through it. So if you guys want to leave it in a two thirds done, one third done, one. Third yeah, it, and, and I don't think it's broken. It's no, no it's not, just, not broken. It's I'm very, very dramatic. Happy. You know, last week was the first time ever have I pre mixed my colors. What I usually I usually don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so. and it's again, it's just by pre mixing. I'm I'm usually pre mixing like five or six big piles. I'm not pre mixing every minute little color because. They're all going to get uh, shifted slightly, but at least just like we saw with uh, uh, with the color spots and stuff earlier, you can see do these, you know, you premix five, six mother colors on your palette and you can go, what? These colors really play nicely together. They're really going to, it's a nice harmony or boy, these colors, you know, don't play well together. They're fighting each other. The green is too green and the purple's too vibrant or, you know, it doesn't match my couch, whatever it is. <laughs> And we, yeah, all right. I could talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Michael, okay, and so, so don't up here in your sky though. Or are oh, you going to remove that blue in your sky? I did. I wiped it back off. You did. I on my computer, it looks like it's still there. I don't know. Probably, I didn't wipe off the middle one. I just wiped off the one that was in the middle of the cloud there. Um, no, I, I'll go back and wipe back a couple areas, of touch, but that's it. Um, that, okay. And don't don't forget to post the still photo of that. Ah, so bad. <laughs> that one was in the reference you first gave us. Then. Yeah, it was on the email I sent, and as as well as it's in the uh, in the um, the group of uh, media. So if you guys are having yeah, but but I mean I mean the still photo of your painting. No, I know. Okay, he's just going to put caps and say unfinished. <laughs> um, yeah. me next okay week. i gotta go folks so uh see you next week okay thank you michael Bye. i had so much fun making this beautiful mess with all of you thank you i can't <laughs> wait to uh, make more mess next week and you guys are doing great i really appreciate you submitting everything karen it's great to see you and we uh bashed your painting for about 45 minutes at the beginning of class so you'll have to watch that um in replay and um might have to edit it though for language um <laughs> it was it's good to see you and uh anyways take care everybody we'll talk to you in a okay bye-bye thank you bye